Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute. Again, welcome, everyone. While we're, while we're waiting to get started, if you want to say hello in the chat box, let us know where you're joining us from. Hello, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a minute. We're saying hello in the chat box right now. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. A link will be made available on NSLA's website. We encourage you to interact with your fellow attendees uh, in the chat box, but if you have a question, that you want asked and answered live, please add that to the Q&A box so we can see it. We also have two other opportunities for you to interact with your fellow attendees. Uh, we'll make a, available a link to a Padlet, which is kind of like a message board. You can post your questions, thoughts, comments, or respond to other people's comments uh, there. And then Friday, we're also gonna be having our open group office hours from one to three. So feel free to stop by then to continue the conversation. Hello, everyone. All right, and with that, I think we're gonna turn things over to Aaron Dworkin now. Aaron? Hey. Oh, thank you, Leslie, and hello, everyone. It is such an honor and pleasure to be with you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Uh, this is our first day of our summer planning boot camp, our first ever one that we've created uh, to meet the moment and to be a resource to all of you. We have a amazing and inspiring uh, lineup, not only today, but for the next four days. Uh, each day we'll, we'll lead off with national experts on a specific topic, followed by uh, acclaimed practitioners, programs, and leaders who are working day in, day out with young people uh, and are planning for this coming summer. So I'm Aaron Dworkin, I'm the CEO of the National Summer Learning Association. I also just wanna highlight and thank our uh, partners for today, our, our title sponsor Scholastic, you'll be hearing from in a minute. And uh, today's sessions are co-presented by our great partners, the After School Alliance and PBS Kids. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So uh, for those of you who don't know, NSLA has been around for more than 25 years, uh, has always been uh, leading the effort to put a spotlight on the issue of summer learning loss and different ways to address it. Uh, we invest in program quality, policy, partnerships, public awareness, and all of you, the people who make all this work possible for young people. Next slide. So we could talk again, we're gonna be talking again today. We've historically talked about summer learning loss. We, we're gonna be talking about COVID learning loss uh, and their connection points and what we could do about it. But I, I will just say that when we think about summer, we're really talking about inequity. We think of the summer months as the most inequitable time in education. And, but we're also, when we're talking about summer, talking about opportunity. And that's the opportunity before all of us right now, coming out of COVID, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, infection rates are going down, hospitalization rates are going down, vaccination rates are going up. Uh, things are beginning to reopen. There's some hope that you know, we'll be able to be together in person, perhaps outside, whatever it'll take to be safe, but to help uh, catch up our kids. So we're gonna be talking about those opportunities uh, and ways we can close these achievement and opportunity gaps that we know have been growing. Next slide. So a, a lot of you may have heard me uh, talk about this, so I don't wanna to totally uh, go through this, but we have wonderful partners on this call, a great audience of leaders from school districts, people from summer camp community, from out of school time, nonprofit organizations, um, from youth employment uh, agencies. So all these and, and, and programs. So we have so many groups that are trying to work together 
And it's when we talk about summer, it's not only to help young people improve, but it's also a great time of professional development. So we think of summer as a time to invest in our adults, to invest in our young people, and set everybody up for success going to the next school year, which I think a lot of people recognize is the opportunity before us. We also talk about summer as a great time for innovation, and we're seeing so much innovation in all of you. We encourage you, but we know you're already doing it. Necessity, the mother of invention. People are being very innovative in how to address uh, the, the obstacles before them and to serve young people. And we'll, we'll talk about that this week. It's also this amazing time, and we're doing it, and we're seeing it right now, to break down the artificial silos in education and to, and to connect. And, and I think this moment calls for hyper-creativity and hyper-collaboration, and we hope to promote that and talk about what that really looks like. And finally, it's a time for impact, not just on a personal side for young people and young students, that the programs you're gonna be running are gonna help them immediately, but have a lasting effect, but also collectively the impact we can have on this country, serving millions of students together, millions of families, millions of communities or thousands of communities, but also having a legacy. If we do this right this summer and the summer of 22, 2022 and, and a few others, we'll be able to just make this, this thing that we all care about, providing high quality summer learning experiences to all young people every year, just the norm and not an exception and not a nice to have, but a need to have. If we go to the next slide. So we have a lot of events coming up. You'll learn more about it uh, later on, but just to say, this is not the only time we'll be talking with you and helping you. We have a conference in November. In July, we'll have our National Summer Learning Week and a lot of trainings and, and, and opportunities to get together between now and then to help you succeed in the coming summer. Next slide. And then we have lots of resources. So our goal every day here is again to have you uh, interact with experts, have you interact with practitioners and to walk away with tangible tools that you can use, you and your staff can use. And here are just some uh, lessons from last summer, uh, a summer learning guide for COVID with lots of resources, our summer starts in September planning guide, all the Wallace summer planning toolkit, which is amazing, the Yale uh, Child Study Center uh, reports uh, and, and tools uh, that Scholastic supports. So there's a lot of information you're gonna get today and every day this week that we hope will be very tangible to you. Next slide. And so then just other things that people should just be aware of. We have uh, year round professional summer learning communities facilitated by expert uh, program facilitators on all these different topics. We would love to give people the time to connect with each other. If you have a specific issue area you care about. Next slide. We also have field consultants who have expertise in lots of topics. So if there's something much more uh, that you want training on or a topic you want to do deeper in, uh, we will have, we can make them available to you and, and, and do something tailored and they have expertise in these different topics. They'll also be available on Friday during the office hours we're making uh, possible for folks. Next slide. And then before we just go to Jimmy at Scholastic, I just want to leave it th with this. There's this great opportunity we all have. We, I think we are pretty well aware. Uh, and I would leave us with a, a challenge and a pledge. The challenge I would like our community to address is uh, to, to not get caught up in a debate and too much of a discussion of whether or not students need academic support or do they need social emotional learning support in arts and enrichment. The answer is they need it all. Uh, they're coming out of a, a very challenging time. And we all need, if we're an academic program primarily, we would encourage you to stretch and figure out how to incorporate some other or partner with some other folks who can bring the social emotional learning and the enrichment in the arts and sports. And if you're a program that's much more focused on enrichment arts and sports, we're gonna ask you to stretch and think about how you can work with your school district, be aligned with their priorities and incorporate academics. And then if, you, if we all rise to meet that challenge, our pledge at NSLA is that we will bring every resource we can to help you develop the high quality program and deliver the program you want with young people this summer and, and coming summers. And if we don't have the answers individually or as an organization, what's great about our community is that collectively we do have these answers and we have research and we have best practices and we have model programs that could show us the way forward. And that's what we need coming out of COVID and in 2021. So thank you all for being here. I'd like to just give a chance to Jimmy, uh, Bream, who's the Vice President of Academic Support at Scholastic to say a few words, and then we'll turn it over to Carl Alexander and our amazing panel. Jimmy? Well, thank you, so much. thank you so much, Aaron, and thank you, NSLA, for the opportunity to support and, and continue our partnership. Uh, a true partnership is what I feel like we have with NSLA and that this amazing experts that you're bringing to your um, 
districts across the country over the next four days are the people that we read, the people that we love to hear from to make sure that the programs that we're putting together as solutions for districts continues to have the top notch research on what students need, what districts need, and maybe most importantly, what teachers need at this time. And that's what we've worked to do for all summers. But in this uh, incredibly critical summer, we certainly are proud of what we've, what we've been able to put together, but just as importantly, what we've done to have a partnership with NSLA, to hear from the people that spend their entire time focusing on this out of school time with what are we doing with students when they're not in that core 185, six and a half hour instructional days. That that really is where we have the opportunity to start talking equity and start talking equity at a deeper level with how do we support students who need additional support in this time when they're not with us? How do we close the achievement gap by making sure we have targeted programs for kids at times when otherwise they wouldn't be receiving instruction. So we are passionate about our summer solutions and very passionate about the chance to partner with NSLA and thank you all deeply. And thank you all the panelists you'll hear from today. Uh, uh, we are humbled to, to be a part and to hear and to learn from you. It was fun to see in the chat box there as everyone was putting up uh, where they are from. I, my, uh, as I was reading those, I, my head is every time I'd see one, I was like, I wonder if Abby knows that in Washington. So someone from Washington State, Abby is our account executive in Washington. I'd see down in Florida, I need to text Maggie and see if they know. That sounds like an amazing organization. Uh, up to Maine, California, Texas, everywhere in between. So it's cool to see. I still see them popping up. So uh, New York, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, just had a great friend in Birmingham. So it's great. It's so neat to see everybody across the country. That is uh, my role with Scholastic as the vice president uh, of, uh, academics is to work with districts on your particular needs, to hear what you envision for your organization, your school, your district, and your community, to hear what you need to make this summer uh, meaningful for you, and then make those solutions work for you. Uh, there is not, uh, solutions don't fit nicely into, into boxes that, that always fit every single need. So what we love to do is to hear from you and to work with you to customize a solution that's going to match what you foresee this summer being. I come to you today, uh, I saw somebody from Paris, Kentucky. So I actually come to you from uh, Versailles, Kentucky, which is just outside of Lexington. So we have a neighbor there, um, but I do get the chance to work with all districts and organizations across this country. So we do ask that you reach out to us so that we can put the solutions together. We're viewing this summer as a chance to work with all students. What can we put in the hands of all students, whether or not they're coming to our summer school at not, or not, what can we put in the hands of all students? And we feel that my book summer, a take home book solutions with family packs uh, and, and think sheets for students is a great solution along with Literacy Pro, which is a digital book solution. So all students are reading this summer. Then we have opportunities for students to actually come and have high quality instructional time with Lit Camp, our, our program, which is built around the seven strengths of a super reader and our Scholastic, um, Scholastic Scholar Zone powered by Bell Excel which has an ELA component as well as math. And then knowing that some students are going to need deep embedded intervention this summer to get them caught up. We have great programs, fast intervention programs that are intense, but we know can move students with Scholastic Rise and Scholastic Edge. So again, we thank you for the opportunity to sponsor today's program and to continue to work with NSLA. And all of you, please reach out to us either through Twitter, uh, scholastic.com slash summer learning is a great place where you can get information or request uh, more information. Or if it's simplest for you, if you dial that number there and you just say, hey, I'm Jimmy and I live in Kentucky, can someone reach out to support me? I will make sure that that happens for you. So thank you, Aaron. Thank you, NSLA. And thank you all of the other panelists today for letting us be a part. We do appreciate you. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Scholastic, as well, for being a terrific partner and investor in the, in the space and community. And now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Carl Alexander, a great leader and, and friend to our community and who did some, some of the seminal research on summer learning loss at Johns Hopkins University, still a national board member of NSLA. Also was a commissioner on the uh, National Academy of Sciences Shaping Summertime Experiences Report, but he'll be our moderator today. So Carl. Well, thank you so much, Aaron. And uh, hello to everyone out there. Uh, I too was watching the uh, locations flash by and it's impressive that uh, the presence of participants from all throughout the country. Uh, it's my honor to help launch the summer boot camp, and it's appropriate that our very first session be focused on research 
And we all have an understanding that the pandemic has been terribly disruptive to schools, to school people and to children's learning. But the need to know is, is acute. We need to understand uh, the severity of the, of the challenges that our children and school, uh, children and, and, and school people have faced. And we need to know uh, the distribution of those challenges, you know, whether some children and some kinds of children have been more severely impacted than others. Uh, the issue can be thought of as COVID slide. Uh, it start, we started hearing that expression. Uh, I'm, reminding of the, I'm reminded of the earlier research on summer slide, and Aaron was kind enough to mention that I and my colleagues played a role in, uh, in, in presenting some of that work. Uh, that was back in the day, 20 plus years ago, and the early research on summer slide um, established the issue that uh, poor children and poor children of color uh, are challenged during the summer months when they're uh, not in school and are dependent and their learning is dependent on the resources available to, to them through their parents and local communities. And uh, many children's means uh, better supports during the summer month, poor children uh, need better supports during the summer month months. Uh, what's interesting to me as, uh, as, a, as a researcher is that, that the research work was very impactful because it did uh, underscore the importance of the issues. And over the years since, um, the, uh, the concerns about summer slide are, are now well understood. And uh, NSLA uh, was itself uh, was inspired uh, by that work to elevate the profile of the issue, to help identify uh, best practices in summer programming and to um, and to argue the case for greater attention and resources uh, to be de devoted towards counteracting summer slide. So the early research was impactful. And here we are today, uh, hopefully uh, seeing the, uh, the light at the end of this long tunnel of the disruptions uh, surrounded the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, but here again, there's a pressing need to know. And I'm thrilled uh, to be able to moderate this panel uh, where uh, participants are some of the folks at the forefront of helping us understand uh, the extent of the disruptions and the consequences of those disruptions for our, uh, for our, our children. So our three panelists uh, presenting their work are Emma Dorn, who's the Education Practice Manager at McKinsey and Company, uh, Megan Kufeld, who's a Senior Research Scientist at the Northwest Education Association, and uh, Winnie Chan, who's the director of P12 research at the Ed Trust. Um, and so uh, rather than take up more of your time, let's hear from the people who have the, uh, the information to share from us, or share with us. I think we're gonna be starting with Emma, is that correct? So thank you so much. And uh, it's a real honor to be here. Um, and it's an honor to play a small part in helping students get what they need. Uh, what I can provide is, is the research base, but all of you folks on the phone, uh, you are the people on the ground who are really gonna be reaching out to the students who are living in poverty, who have been most impacted by the pandemic. And so I'm honored to be on the phone with all of you and thank you for all of the work that, that you all do. Um, so just to give a little bit of the research base, um, uh, and a little bit of context uh, of what I'm going to share today. So um, McKinsey and Company did uh, some work back in 2009 looking at achievement and opportunity gaps. And as the pandemic hit, we immediately thought, what is the impact of this going to be on, on students across the country? Uh, and so we reached out to um, our friends at Curriculum Associates uh, to try to get an understanding from the full assessments um, how students were doing in the fall of 2020 compared to the fall of 2019. Um, to try to get some a real evidence base to understand were students falling behind, what was the impact of remote learning? Uh, and so if you go to the next slide, what we found uh, as we looked at that data, um, sorry, one more on, um, was that tangible learning loss had already occurred. And so what you see here is the impact of the shutdowns in the spring. So this is the impact of the assessments that were taken in the fall, somewhere between September uh, to October um, of 2020. And so what this really reflects is uh, how much learning students had in the previous academic year 
compared to acad other academic years. And so what we found is that students learned about 67% of the math that they would normally learn and about 87% uh, of the reading that they would normally learn in, in that previous 2019 to 2020 school year. And if you try and translate that, well, what does that really mean? Uh, we, we tried to translate that into, into months of learning lost. Now, this isn't actually months of learning lost, it's months of learning that students normally would have had that they didn't gain, right? Uh, and so one of the things, you know, very early on in the pandemic, we were very worried that students might actually um, be losing learning in, in a similar way that they do in summer slide for every month out of school. Um, and, and so the good news is here that maybe it wasn't quite that bad, uh, but they instead, they're not progressing at the speed we'd expect. And that still is gonna have a big impact. So if we look just, you know, in October, in the fall of 2020, and we translate that into to months of learning loss, what we find is that students have already, are already a month and a half behind in reading and three months behind in mathematics to where we would expect them to be. And so that was already a, a frightening statistic. And so that immediately raised the question is, um, uh, the, the next sort of question we had is, are there inequities in, in that learning loss? And what we found is absolutely. And so if you look at this slide, the little blue dots here, are um, schools that have more than 50% white students, so majority white schools, tend to be more well-resourced as well. Um, and the schools with the little black dots are schools with greater than 50% students of color. We wanted also to do uh, an economic breakdown. We didn't have the data at the level of granularity, so that's why you see the racial breakdown here. But what you see here is that there are some big differences, and those differences are across every single subject. Uh, and they're across every single year uh, of education. Um, the, the pandemic is hurting students of color more than it's hurting uh, predominantly white students. Uh, and so we wanted to kind of scratch the surface then and look um, what are causing some of these opportunity gaps that are leading to these achievement gaps and, and are those closing? And therefore, what can we say about what's gonna happen through the rest of the school year? Because this is obviously what was happening in October. Since then, you know, we've had November, December, uh, January, February, and we're already into March. So if you come to, over to the next slide, we wanted to look at why was learning loss uh, so unequal? Oh, up one, I think. I think we may be missing a slide. Oh, no, sorry, you're, you're correct, apologies. Um, go, go back up one, apologies. The page numbers are a little bit different. Thank you so much. So the other thing that's really important to, to um, and Aaron talked a little bit about this, to to highlight is that these learning losses aren't just academic. So we could only look at the academic uh, learning loss because that's the data that we had. But what we find as we looked at the literature more broadly is that students have also experienced a broader set of losses over the pandemic. Um, there are curriculum areas that we didn't look at. There are broader skills and capabilities. Um, one thing that I, I found particularly um, worrying is there were some Ofsted reports in the UK that showed that students had regressed, um, had forgotten how to potty train, others had forgotten how to hold a pencil properly, and so real regressions uh, that, that are quite worrying. And then of course, mental and physical health. Um, there have been studies showing that students have gained weight, the rising uh, rates of uh, obesity, lower levels of physical health, and then of course the anxiety and depression. And so as we think about, as we move forwards, the rest of my presentation is going to be very focused on the academics, but I do want people to hold in mind that that's not the only problem that we're facing. So moving on, sorry, now to the opportunity gaps. If we look at why the learning loss is so unequal, um, that there are a number of things driving that. And, and the first is just where students are learning. Uh, and so as we look at the fall, if we go to the next slide and we look at um, where students were learning um, as they moved back into schooling in the fall of 2020, um, and you can see that there's a 20 percentage point difference between uh, black and white students in, in the modality of learning. So black and Hispanic students, about 70% of them were fully remote, whereas only about 50% of white students were fully remote. And though um, many students have now begun to transition back into in-person or hybrid, we still see significant racial disparities with the large urban centers being some of the last to transition back. The, the second thing is if you are remote, well, obviously the prerequisite for learning remote is having good internet uh, and a device that can be effective for learning. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, what we see here is that though 
the gaps have narrowed since the spring, there are still significant remaining gaps. And, and so black and Hispanic students are less likely to have access to devices for learning. That's on the left-hand side of this slide and less likely to have access to uh, an effective internet connection. Uh, and, and obviously if without access, uh, it, it, it's very hard to learn remotely. Um, the one that actually shocked me the most, uh, if we go on to the next slide, is the access to live teacher instruction. And um, what we found here is, this was a question asked to, to students is, over the past week, how many days of access have you had to any kind of live interaction with teachers that could be in person, it could be by phone, it could be a video call, a Zoom, Google Classroom kind of call, Microsoft Teams. And, and what we found is that there were 15 to 16% of black and Hispanic students said they had had zero days, no access to live contacts with teachers over the previous week, which basically means they're not getting the support and help that they need. And that's double the number uh, as, as white students. And so then, as we look forward, uh, if we go to the next slide, what does that mean? Uh, what do those opportunity gaps mean as we now think about what, how are students going to be ending up this school year? Um, they're going to be coming into the summer. Where are they going to be coming into the summer? Uh, and so obviously there's so many moving pieces here. We, we developed four different scenarios. So the first scenario on the next page, we basically just straight lined the curriculum associates results that we had seen. Uh, for the spring and said, what if nothing changed since the spring? Uh, and what we found is if we, we extrapolated those lines, on average, students would end up this school year about 10 months behind in mathematics, where you would have expected them to be if there had not been a pandemic. And that's, you know, our school year is 10 months. So that's basically a school year behind in math. With white students being about somewhere between five to nine months behind, and students of color being somewhere between 12 and 16 months behind. These are big, scary numbers. Now, the good news is, is we think we've dodged this bullet. We think school districts did a, made a huge effort over the summer to improve access, to improve remote learning. And of course, some st students are back in person. And, and so if we go to the next slide, our, our kind of status quo assumption um, is that things continue kind of as they, they have been through the fall. Uh, and, and if that's the case, we're looking more at nine months overall with uh, seven to eight months for white students and 11 to 12 months for, for students of color, which are still really big numbers and, and really quite scary. But there are things that we can do to make this better between now the school and the end of the school year, the school year is intended. And, and there are two of those. The first is, is uh, if we go to the next slide, we can, we can make investments to improve the quality of remote and hybrid learning. So if we can improve uh, remote learning to some of the best um, virtual learning historically, we could reduce um, that loss to six months. And if we can, on the next slide, actually get some kids, more kids back in person. Um, and, and this report was published in December. And so this was um, getting kids back in person January 1st, uh, then we could have reduced the loss to five months. So a couple of things as we kind of think through this and uh, in the big picture, and if we go to the next slide, uh, on the one hand, there's a lot that can be done now to improve uh, the situation. But on the other hand, even the best case scenarios here end up with kids about half a school year behind and with significant inequalities in that. And so we're gonna have to be doing something quite uh, structural and systematic over the summer and, and next summer to help kids catch up. And, and, and then the second thing is, is this is really important for these students' futures. Um, students have obviously been learning a lot of other things as they've been at home, but this formal mathematic and, um, and English language learning is instrumental in, in what's gonna happen for these kids in, in the future. And if we go to my last slide, if you take that kind of middle point of seven months of learning loss, that translates into 60 to $80,000 of lifetime earning loss for the average student. So it has a real impact on their lives. They're less likely to graduate, less likely to get a job that fulfills them and that enables them to keep their family in a sustainable position. And it also translates into a GDP loss. There's less innovation in the economy. And we've projected that with seven months of learning loss, if we don't help students catch that up, we're looking at 170 to 270 
billion dollars of annual loss in GDP um, because of less, less innovation in, in the US economy. So I'll stop there. I think I maybe went a couple of minutes over time, um, but there's the imperative and I'm excited by all of the efforts that you guys are gonna be uh, rolling out to, to try and help students as, as they accelerate their learning. Well, thank you. Thank you, Emma. And next we'll turn to Megan Kufeld and uh, <clears throat> here are some of the work that's being done at the Northwest Education Association labs. Good morning, everyone. Um, like the other panelists have mentioned, I'm so honored to be here talking to you all today. Um, you know, I am a researcher, but I think that the, the way we get out of this is through all of you, all the work that's going to happen on the ground to help catch kids up from this really, really tough year. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about a research study we did at NWEA, um, very in some ways similar to some of the work that Emma did, uh, but using a different data source and, and breaking down the results a little bit differently. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So uh, in this study, um, similar to Emma, we were focused on the same time period. So looking uh, before the pandemic began, relative to this fall. So we cannot speak really um, yet to what's happening throughout the course of the current school year we're in. So we really in this study are focused primarily on the first, you know, six to nine months of the pandemic as students, you know, schools closed down in the spring, students had remote learning in the spring and then returned to school in the fall, either remotely or in person. And we did two primary comparisons. First, looking at how students were performing this fall relative to a typical fall. So very similar to what Emma presented. And then secondly, we also looked at growth because we really wanted to understand how students um, are actually learning, not just how their achievement um, was, was compared to a previous fall. Uh, next slide, please. And in this study, uh, I'm going, all the data I will be speaking about is from the MAP growth assessments, which are an interim assessment that is provided by NWA to school districts across the country. Uh, sorry, could we go? There we go. Um, and uh, our sample in the study is 4.4 uh, million students. And it's not nationally representative, but it, it does come from school districts all in all 50 states in the country. And uh, we will be focusing only on grades three to eight in this study because uh, this study, um, unlike Emma's, does actually combine students who were testing in school districts that were able to be operating remotely or, or offering assessments. Um, sorry, but yeah, the school districts that were offering assessments in person as well as remotely. Um, and so that, that widens our sample. It, it does add additional challenges for interpreting the data. But we focused on grades three to eight because we believe those were the grades where the comparability was higher between in-person and remote. We found that students who were testing in the younger grades remotely were more likely to have uh, help from parents or, or some sort of additional assistant that's, uh, assistance that may have changed the results. Um, and we will be uh, focusing only on public schools uh, in this study. Uh, next slide, please. So the first question we were really interested in was how are students performing this fall re relative to a typical school year in math and reading? Next slide, please. And uh, because the scale that the you know, various assessments are given in different scales, and it can be very hard to translate those results into something meaningful, what we did in this, uh, in this graph, in, in this way of reporting, is report things in ter terms of the percentile rank of student scores. And so this is very similar to if you went to a pediatrician's office and saw the height and weight percentiles for a child, it's basically saying how students are doing relative to a national sample of kids. And in this case, that's a national sample of kids that was uh, before the pandemic began. So this can help us talk about how kids are doing kind of relative to a national expectation if a pandemic wasn't occurring. Uh, and what we did was we compared students in third grade last year to the group of students who are in third grade this year. And in our sample, we found that the students who were in third grade last year were performing above average, so above the 50th percentile. Uh, but this year in math, that had slipped quite a bit, so five to 10 percentile uh, points, which is a pretty considerable drop for just, you know, in this case, uh, for these results, we're only talking about the kind of spring closures through summer period. We're not even talking about what's happening this year. The good news though is in this study at least, uh, we didn't find very considerable impacts in reading. So students uh, in reading in grades three to eight 
were performing pretty similar to a typical year. And in a few grades in late elementary school, there were minor drops, but it wasn't, and overall the story was pretty promising for reading. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then the second question we looked at was how students are growing since the pandemic began. And so, you know, as Emma brought up, there, there's this question of learning loss, which is that oftentimes it's measured as students are actually doing worse by the fall than they were in the spring. So there was actually a tangible loss. Whereas what we might be seeing more of this year is that students are continuing to make gains. They're just not making the same gains that would be expected in a typical school period. So they're doing worse than expectation or what would typically be done, but that doesn't mean they haven't learned anything since the spring. Uh, next slide, please. So what we did was we looked at growth from the winter right before the pandemic began. So students who were tested in January and February of 2020 and looked at how they had progressed in terms of their test scores from the winter to this fall. And so what we're seeing here in these plots is that uh, these, are, these are change scores uh, for students since uh, from the winter to the fall, where the zero mark, that black dotted line, is a student whose test score is exactly the same between the winter and the fall. What, uh, what we have here with the blue kind of distribution is the distribution of gain scores this year. So if it shifted to the right of zero, it means that uh, the majority of students are actually making learning gains since the pandemic began. If it shifted to the left, it means that the majority of students are not making learning gains. Um, and then the red line provides a, a reference point for what would be happening in a typical year. So what we can see when reading is that those two distributions are basically on top of each other and they are shifted to the right, which means that the majority of students have made gains in reading since the pandemic began. Whereas in math, what we see in grades three to eight is that um, students are making gains on average in most of the grades. So they, have, they are learning since the pandemic began, but those rates of gains are lower than what we see in a previous school year in, in the 2019 period. So that results in uh, students falling behind relative to the, their peers in previous grades. Um, and finally, the, the last way we broke the, the results down was to look at students who are kind of falling behind uh, relative to the expectations to the norm. So these are students who had been performing, let's say at the top quintile of test score distribution. So, you know, really high up in the rankings and maybe are falling behind uh, relative to these, to the kind of grade level expectations. And what we found in, you know, the kind of continued story was that math was worse than reading. So we found that uh, twice as many students were slipping in these uh, rankings relative to a previous year in grades three to eight, whereas in reading it looked pretty similar. So we, we found about 54% of students were kind of staying at the same place they were in before. 14% of students were making gains and 31% of students were falling behind. So I think, you know, all in all, the, these results really indicate that, um, you know, where we're seeing the biggest losses so far, at least on these assessments, is in math rather than reading. Though one of the important things to keep in mind in terms of the, some of the limitations of these findings um, are that we did have fewer students testing this year than in previous years. And so that means that we're not able to make inferences about the students who we may be worried are the most vulnerable. And those may be students who, you know, have not had access to internet during this whole period or have really, you know, disconnected from schools. And so, sorry, cat of course crawled on my lap right, right when I started talking. Um, so I apologize for the distraction. But uh, so that is an important thing to keep in mind. And this may come up more in the Q&A is that in some ways, this is a very optimistic story that we're seeing, especially around reading, but it could be, it, it could be kind of a best case scenario due to the fact we do have a lot of missing data in this sample. And one of the reasons we didn't break out our results in the study by race, ethnicity, or by poverty the way Emma did is that those missing data rates uh, in our study were, were disproportionately higher among students of color. And so that does mean that we, we saw some kind of small differences by race ethnicity in particular, where black and Hispanic students in reading were showing larger declines in, um, in reading than uh, white students, but it could actually be much larger than that. And we're just missing the story because of this missing data.
So I do want to put that out as a caveat for that. We, I think, are getting more knowledge about what's happening this school year and what's happening in terms of the math and reading, but there's still many things we don't know. Uh, and next slide, please. So I just wanted to wrap up with, I think, a few takeaways from this research. I mean, I think this, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, so I'm not sure all of these things need to be said, but you know, students have had a really tough year and we really need continued funding to help get schools opened safely as soon as possible. And then think about these next steps, summer, next school year, the next summer after that, and making sure students can have the resources that they need. And um, I don't, you know, this group is probably more well aware than anyone else, but uh, districts, programs, we need to be talking and thinking now about how we can do these different things uh, to help support students. Um, and I think the, the final caveat that I think Aaron you know, mentioned really well is we, this is both academic and non-academic losses. Uh, we have much better data on what's going on academically, but both sides are really, really important this year. Uh, so I think that is it for me. Thank you all very much. Oh, we can, sorry, we can <laughs> Thank you, Megan. And, uh, whoops. <laughs> okay, thank you, Megan. So our, our last presentation for this uh, session will be uh, Winnie Chan from the uh, EAD Trust. Look forward to hearing your remarks, Winnie. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me and thank you uh, for all the participants. Um, I think this is actually perfect timing uh, with me following up Megan and Emma. Um, the research that I'll be talking about is actually um, in collaboration with MDRC. I trust uh, did literature rev uh, review on three uh, promising practices to really um, uh, make an impact on capturing the unfinished learning. And the first one Megan already talked about is high intensity tutoring. The second one I think will be um, music to the ears of everyone here looking at extended learning opportunities, including summer opportunities. And the last one is thinking through how to promote positive adult and youth relationship. And like Aaron um, and everyone said, um, academic and non-academic um, challenges and needs of students are not isolated, they're inter interconnected. So I want to emphasize that high intensity uh, tutoring, extended learning opportunities, and positive adult and youth relationship are all connected. We can think about um, in the literature, we know with high intensity tutoring, um, ongoing training, and making sure that students are receiving uh, at level, at grade level curriculum, it's really critical to making good impact. And we know that is challenging and difficult to have teachers to do tutoring on top of everything else they do. So I think, think about as, uh, summer programming and hiring para, uh, professionals who have experience working with young people through summer programs and after school program and giving them training to become tutors is a great way to think about scale up high intensity tutoring. And of course, uh, importantly, youth and adult relationship when students are going back to the building. Um, this year has been very challenging and particularly challenging for students of color and students from low income family because they also experience high disproportionate impact of COVID-19. So the important is for teachers, school staff, extended learning, paraprofessional to think about how do we build relationship in a positive way with young people so that they feel cared for, they feel safe when they come back to the school building. So the three briefs from Etrus will come out soon. I will make sure to make them available. Um, in addition to reviewing the literature, I think one of the things that's gonna be most interesting to everyone here is that actually based on the literature, our, our policy team uh, came up with some uh, guidelines for how do you implement these practices um, based on the best practice and evidence we we have from the academic review we highlight things um, such as you know where do you do trade-offs so in high intensity tutoring like I said um, training is very important even if we cannot have teachers we need to make sure that paraprofessionals are trained um, there's been conversation about using uh, hiring college students through AmeriCorps to do tutoring, which is a great idea, but the training is very critical. Um, positive adult relationship. I think the literature for mentoring tell us that, you know, in addition to having academic um, goals, it's really important to develop that um, uh, trusting 
relationship and making sure that young people feel like they are empowered and in, and in charge of what happens in that relationship. And that extends to what happens in a tutoring context. Um, the second topic I want to cover really quickly today is to talk about the early learners. Um, I think from Megan and Emma, we learned that the unfinished learning is quite large in um, K to 12, but we also know that there has been a drastic decrease in enrollment in pre-K um, during the pandemic. So one um, uh, at Trust just recently did a, a survey. We invited uh, all coordinators from 50 states to participate. And we found some um, promising, but also troubling results. So um, of the 50 states that we uh, got the survey results from, 29 of them responded. And we found that at least five of them said that the referral rates and the um, actual service rates of receiving early intervention services. And these are services that are needed for children who are um, uh, with learning disabilities or not progressing the same rate as typically um, uh, typical development. Um, and they're critical for academic success. So Black and Latino uh, children are receiving and getting referred for these services at a lower rate. And some of them are waiting for longer to get referral or waiting for longer to get these critical services. Um, but I think one of the most important um, lessons learned from this survey from, um, for us is that many, and I say many because only five states have such data, many states do not have the data disaggregated by race or income level. So we don't know the extent to which the disparities are. Um, so that's another thing to think about as we move forward to having um, pre-K uh, students enroll in kindergarten. Um, this year, upcoming academic year for kindergartners is going to be very different because many of them may or may not have the opportunity to have the pre-K education that they would have had if it wasn't for COVID. And as we know, that, um, that impact is disproportionately felt by our Black and Brown communities and uh, families from low-income background. Um, so given all that we know about unfinished learning, just wanted to wrap up and say that um, it is truly something that is from pre-K to 12 and the impact is substantial, but there are a lot of things we can do to really accelerate learning for students. And that will probably um, start this summer and, and carry through this academic year upcoming and the next summer and beyond. And the most, the really important message is that to think about how to, um, give the support and resources through um, evidence-based programming, like the high intensity tutoring, extended learning opportunities, uh, building positive relationship. Those are three mechanisms through which we can really uh, make a great impact to catch up students in terms of the unfinished learning they have acquired because of the pandemic. Okay, well, thank you, Winnie. Uh, we have a few more minutes, uh, in just a few minutes actually, our session ends at two East Coast time. Uh, I have a couple thoughts and then I'd like to throw it open for Q&A from the participants uh, on our Zoom session. Uh, first, I wanna commend the three panelists. Uh, uh, really very grateful. Uh, the folks at um, NEWA and at McKinsey have proven to be very adept and resourceful in bringing uh, data to bear on these, these critically important questions. Uh, as, uh, as both Megan and Emma will acknowledge, uh, the data sources fall short of the textbook ideal, and we have to be mindful of the limitations. Uh, it was quite striking in both the presentations to see the difference between math and reading, that the consequences for, uh, for children in terms of lost opportunities uh, were much more substantial in math than in reading. Uh, that in and of itself doesn't particularly surprise me. There's a long literature that establishes that, a that for the de development of mathematical skills and competency, school-based learning is much more critical than home-based learning. Um, it's very simple. Uh, parents don't practice or rehearse uh, mathematics training uh, at home to the extent that they do reading and learning the words and so forth. Uh, so the reading math disparities are not too terribly surprising, but I must say I am surprised that the reading results uh, indicate that there's very little differential in, in learning loss pre-pandemic pre, pre uh, compared to what we're seeing in the middle of the pandemic. And you know, the story is still unfolding. It's not quite told yet. Uh, I will note though that the, um, the pre-pandemic pre baseline that's used 
absorb summer learning loss into it. So the fact that you that the reading scores uh, in the middle of the pandemic look so similar to those prior to the pandemic doesn't mean that everything's uh, uh, fine in the world uh, because we know the summer learning loss is very prevalent. It impacts uh, needy children uh, most profoundly. And the pre-pandemic baseline scores that are used in this research have summer learning loss absorb, absorbed into them. So to see no um, additional severe consequences associated with the pandemic doesn't mean that there aren't issues here that need to be addressed. Um, that said, I am still surprised that the reading results uh, look to be so, ben ben not so benign, and I uh, welcome uh, exploring with others uh, some of the possible reasons for that. Uh, uh, there could be substantive reasons that the school people have gotten much more adept in working with children through distant learning, distance learning. Um, but I suspect that there are some research design and procedural issues that are clouding the issue there. Um, personally, uh, my intuition tells me that uh, that the, uh, the consequences of COVID, COVID slide, has been impactful both in both reading and, and math. And as the research that we just uh, reviewed uh, establishes, the that impact is most pronounced for our neediest children, and we need to be mindful of that. Uh, so with that said, I'd like to just uh, throw it open for questions from the audience. Uh, I think the, Leslie will probably moderate that, and I'll just uh, sit back and... Uh, and see what people have to say. Yes, thank you, Carl. Um, My pleasure. We, we had one question from Kenneth. Um, as a math slash STEM based engineering nonprofit, we run four to six week sessions per year, winter, spring, summer, and fall. How can we be, be more effective in having these kids retain the information? We focus on Title I population. So any thoughts? on how to help kids retain. I would say our research was much more on the sizing of the loss and maybe some of those questions can come up more in the, the later panels or um, as we try to then work out how do we actually address some of this. Um, I'm, I'm sure as you continue to listen through the week we'll we'll get more into the uh, brass tacks of, of addressing. Um, just quickly on, I, I know that we talked a little bit on, on at the high level on, um, on on how to address learning loss. I, I think in terms of retention, one of the things that has been shown very effective is this repetition uh, cycle, right? Where you have, and this isn't the, the initial research that we're doing right now, but uh, just in general, some of the research that I've read is, is showing the more that you can loop back to the same material over time really helps students retain. But hopefully we'll get into that in some of the later uh, panels as well. Um, to go ahead and kind of go along with this, could we give a little bit more explanation or detail on what you meant by high intensity tutoring? Yeah, so in the literature is uh, mostly defined by a few characteristics. Um, high intensity is really talking about the frequency of tutoring. So the ones that are most impactful, meaning seeing the most gains in academic um, outcomes are daily tutoring. Um, that happens every day within the school hours. Um, and the best practices are that we are not um, taking students out of class. It's actually tutoring that is offered to all students. Um, so it could be a uh, additional hour or uh, tutoring that happens during um, uh, um, free period. Um, and also high, high, high intensity tutoring is also most impactful and effective when it's being delivered by paraprofessional teachers are the best, but if teachers are not available, uh, paraprofessionals who have received training and curriculum is critical. It should be at the grade level. So it's accelerating learning, not remediation. Um, and also curriculum that aligns with what they're learning in class also have the most effects. And um, tutoring, high intensity tutoring, tutoring has actually been found to be most effective at early age, pre-K to kindergarten, actually you see the largest impact. Uh, if I could just jump in and add uh, a thought. Uh, I think Winnie's, Winnie's quite correct in this and in and, and that there's a long, research literature, long-standing uh, long research literature that establishes the effectiveness of one-on-one of -on -one tutoring. It's also one of the more expensive interventions. So it's not something that you can do uh, with uh, budgets being so 
desperately strained. Uh, but we know that high quality tutoring is, is very effective, probably the single best intervention that we were, were aware of. And, um, and I would add another, another uh, detail that I think is, is, is well established now. Just in time interventions are critical too. So once a, once a issue, a shortfall or a learning gap presents itself, the sooner that you can try to address it uh, in an intimate way with one-on-one -on -one tutoring if possible, uh, the greater the likelihood of seeing successful outcomes. One other thing I would just add on the tutoring is that uh, although it is expensive, I think there are ways to make it more affordable. And so one of the programs that we looked at was the Match Saga model where um, the ratios weren't one-on-one, -on -one, they were one to two. Um, and that it was de delivered by uh, paraprofessionals. Um, and, and so that reduces the cost a little bit. It could be recent college grads, um, for example. Um, the other thing that um, I think is different with the high intensity versus the regular tutoring is it's 30 to 50 minutes of daily or three to five times a week tutoring. And so it's not your volunteer model. I tutor a student, you know, once a week for an hour and I help them to read, which is, is nice, but that doesn't have the same evidence base as this high intensity three to five times a week, at least 30 minutes, in addition to your regular instruction, where you're really reinforcing the grade level learning the student is um, getting in the classroom and then scaffolding those gaps. Uh, and though it's expensive, um, it's about 2,500 per student per year. Um, what we've looked at is that that would cost about $66 billion to ramp up to the whole of the population. Sounds like an impossible amount of money when you then think if you don't do this, the GDP loss is $170 billion a year going forwards. And so it's really an investment in our future. Um, and, and the results are really quite impressive. Some of these tutoring models can help students get one to two years of additional math learning in just a year. I think we have time for maybe one, maybe two more questions, let's see. Um, do you think children adapting to technology and having to practice with visual instructions more often might be positively impacting their reading scores? While math might be suffering a bit more because of the lack of live in-person access to instructions that Emma talked about. So do we think that the, the, the fact that they're having to do online schooling, is that helping to impact the reading scores maybe? I mean, I think to some extent, if you can already read, then you're in a good position. Um, I also tutor, so the, the young man I tutor is in fourth grade and he has about a first grade reading level and he's not able to access really very much of remote learning at all because he can't read to learn yet. And so um, I think it really depends where you are. I also think if we looked at our reading scores, there was significant reading loss in, in the study that we did. And I think one of the reasons perhaps that we found reading loss was that we only looked at the in-school assessments where the assessment environment was the same um, uh, to in previous years. Uh, and so though that's a shame because it mean, meant that we couldn't look at the impact of students who were still remote. What it does mean is that we have high confidence that um, it's all apples to apples comparison to previous years. Uh, and that 1.5 months of, of reading loss in the fall, if we extend that out, that's a significant loss going forwards. There's also been other studies just published in the last couple of weeks looking at uh, reading loss and it's greatest at the kindergarten and first grade level, which again, if you haven't let, yet learned to read, you can't be doing that reading to learn that, that students are doing in later years. Um, okay, I think we'll take one last question. Um, any thoughts on how we, getting, how we can get parents to understand the importance of this information? <laughs> Carol, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> well, uh, invite them to participate in sessions like this one. It's um, it's basically it's a matter of getting the word out. In the, and but I think it has to be at, done most effectively at the local level uh, with uh, trusted sources. Uh, but in point of fact, it is. I mean, it's, it's like the question of how you how you help get more vaccines in, in the arm when you have a lot of vaccine skeptics. Uh, I don't think there's any substitute for information and information sharing and uh, in every venue that we can think to get the word out, we should be working energetically and vigorously. Uh, we've got people on this webinar from all over the country uh, who in their local communities probably no doubt have avenues for conveying uh, the work that they do and sharing the information that we're sharing. 
and I would encourage everyone to take take away the main points from these discussions and try to get the word out in their local communities. Great. And with that, I will we'll wrap up now. Thank you, everyone, thanks our panelists, and I'll throw it back over to Aaron. Okay. Well, thank you all to all our panelists and thank you to everyone. We're going to have a, a great session coming up now, but I want to again just thank, thank you, Emma, Winnie, Megan, and Carl. All your information got a, was a great kickoff uh, for us. And we're going to just quickly uh, take a second. And before we get to our next panel, which will be practitioners, how do you act on this data? We're going to highlight some of our best practice uh, award winning national um, summer learning program partners. Uh, breakthrough Collaborative, Young Audiences, plus an Apple Distinguished Educator and, and someone from PBS Kids uh, talking about different resources and tips and, and tools that we could all use in our summer program. Before we get there, I want to just emphasize behind all the data and behind the statistics are real human beings, real students that we care about, that have names, that have lives, that we're all focused on serving. And one of our great partners, After School Alliance, has a uh, after school ambassador program where they're working with student leaders uh, who are speaking out on behalf of, of these programs. So we wanna just uh, give, bring up their voice for a, a second here and ground us again and why we're all doing this work and hear from some of these amazing student leaders in our field. Leslie. Hi, my name is Andre Smith. Um, I'm 15 years old. I'm currently located in Galveston, Texas and my program is Keystone. So over the summer, it was it was different. Not not too many people could come in. Not too many people could go out. It was you had to wear your mask, constantly wash your hands. You can't, you know, we can't. Normally, what we would do over the summer, we couldn't do over the summer. While I was virtual in school, the Boys and Girls Club had a Blue Learning Lab, and that's where you pick your hours to come in and do your work when you were online. It was helpful in so many ways because like, um, especially during the time that we're going through, they helped us with our schoolwork, but it was from a distance, which was, you know, pretty not, you know, I really used to getting help from a distance or, you know, walking in the building, wanting to hug the staff members. It was, it was just, it was different. My program has been engaging with us throughout the pandemic through like a weekly schedule. A typical day in my program is um, from 3.30 p.m. to about 4.15, no, 4.30 p.m. We have tutoring. And so, you know, we could have these tutors help us with our homework or we can work on our homework by ourselves. But, you know, we have that option of getting assistance if we need it. However, we also have extracurricular activities, so it's not always focused on school. You know, we just had this whole range of opportunities that allow us to branch out of, you know, this one box, which could range from poetry, music, um, physical activity, uh, et cetera. And, you know, it just keeps us on our toes and keeps our minds working, you know, especially during this pandemic where you can feel like you've just been in this point of, you know, stagnation. Great. So, uh, well, I I love hearing from students uh, from Andre and, and Andy, and you know these are leaders of our field. And I would just recommend and urge anyone if you don't have a youth advisory board or a way to incorporate youth voice and, and choice and getting input and guidance from the students in your program, I would encourage you to do so. There's a lot of best practices on how to set that up. But obviously, we want to create programs they want to be in that they take ownership of, and, and hearing what they need and what they want and then what they want the program to look like will make a big difference for all of us. So now uh, we, you heard us earlier mention we have uh, our NSLA field consultants who are leading these professional year-round summer learning communities. One of them we're very lucky to have join us to moderate the next panel is Navani Nobles who leads our new vision for summer school cohort which we've had for decades which is uh, bringing together the leaders of summer school programs and school districts around the country to reimagine what uh, summer school can look like. 
but uh, she's going to be leading our next session with our award-winning uh, programs I mentioned. So I'll turn it over to Jumani. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, I'm honored to be here with everyone. Thank you for um, joining us today. Um, as mentioned, I will be leading our panel this afternoon, and we have some amazing distinguished guests. So I know that they can introduce themselves way better than I could. So um, I'll have each um, member of the panel, please come off mute and introduce themselves. Um, if you could introduce yourself and discuss your work to support summer learning for 2021, I would really appreciate it. We'll start with um, Curtis, then Lauren, Kate after, and finally Kurt. Thank you. Happy Monday, everyone. First of all, a panel with two Kurts with a K. When has that ever happened? <clears throat> This is going to be great. I'm so excited. <laughs> so excited to be here. Uh, I am Curtis with a K. Uh, uh, Donnelly from Young Audiences of Maryland in Baltimore. And uh, I specifically work on a program called the Summer Arts and Learning Academy, um, which is uh, a partnership with Baltimore City Public Schools and essentially is the primary uh, Title I funded summer program for elementary school students. Uh, across the district. So we serve students in pre-K through fifth grade, uh, about 2,000 students a year in, in 10 locations throughout, uh, throughout Baltimore City. Um, we are super proud to be the in the most recent class of winners of the uh, NSLA uh, National Summer Learning Award, Award this past year. Um, and so I will uh, I'll talk a little bit more as we get into the discussion about kind of how how we've evolved a little bit for 2021. But uh, just to want to share briefly kind of our main tenants uh, 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 that we're trying to make sure we keep uh, uh, in in the forefront, no matter what our program ends up looking like. So we are, you know, obviously a district, a large district run program, and we are planning to be in person this summer um, with 20 students in a room. Our model. Uh, pairs professional teaching artists and classroom teachers, uh, and we pay them a lot of money to plan or for a lot of time for planning, and a lot of money, of course. It's not expensive, but it's very important. Uh, and essentially, we do arts integration. So uh, we, we allow teachers and artists to be creative together, and we tell them, here's the things that we know these students need, but you actually probably know what they need better. Um, and we want you to just do it in a, in a, in a way that looks different. Um, and so uh, we, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of staff and a lot of, um, uh, we believe in, in allowing students to kind of build relationships with lots of different people from all, uh, all different types of wa walks of life and experiences from all the way from interns through through elders in the community. And uh, we'll, when we get to 2021, that's definitely one of our challenges because we, we know we can't be mixing um, staff and students at the same rate that we normally do. What's been interesting for us, and then I'll, I'll pass it back, but uh, we have been fortunate enough uh, uh, to been asked to, to pilot a, an in-person program, an after school program here in Baltimore City for this full school year. We've been on, we've been virtual. Actually, today is our first day in Baltimore City for kindergarten through second graders coming back. Um, but uh, they asked us if we would uh, work together on this to really kind of figure out the processes of how do we actually work with external partners in city school buildings and make sure that all of the safety and the communication needs are met especially around COVID. So that's really influenced what we're planning for the summer. And uh, I'm happy to share some more of that later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Curtis. Um, I see that we got some love for um, young audiences in Baltimore in the chat. Thank you uh, to, for those of you for the shout outs. Um, next, let's hear from Lauren um, from Breakthrough Miami, please. Everybody. Um... Thank you so much. I'm so happy and excited to be here and share with you guys today. Um, my name is Lauren Kellner Rudolph. I'm the Managing Program Director with Breakthrough Miami. We're a nonprofit academic enrichment program um, based in Miami, but part of a national collaborative. So there's 26 breakthroughs throughout the US. Uh, we are excited to be in the class of 2018 on uh, National Summer Learning winners. Um, but we are an academic enrichment program that 
support students um, from fifth all from fifth grade all the way through their graduating year in high school. So it's an eight year academic enrichment program that serves students both over the summer and throughout the school year. Uh, our summer program is a six week um, summer institute um, that focuses both on core academics and electives. Um, we serve 1300 students throughout Miami-Dade County. Uh, we do that through a really exciting and unique students teaching students model. So we have older high school and college students that we train to be their teachers over the summer. We call them our teaching fellows. Um, with that, we're also very focused on the second side of our mission, which is inspiring the next generation of educational advocates and creating a diverse um, future educators as well. Um, so we have 130 teaching fellows that serve uh, every summer along with about 400 volunteers. Um, and we're doing this across eight different sites uh, here in Miami. Um, so that's kind of scope, uh, as I said, it's over the summer, we're focused on the core academics um, and we're really focused on preparing our students for the next grade level ahead. So we're working with students that are highly motivated and have huge amounts of potential but are coming from under-resourced communities and families. So we know that they have all of the potential in the world and we call ourselves opportunity generators to make sure that they have the opportunities to, to reach that full potential. Um, in addition to core academics, we focus a lot on social emotional learning using the Cassell competencies and frameworks. We have created what we call success planning, which in, uh, involves one on one um, support uh, and having students create smart goals and, and work towards achieving those smart goals. Um, and, and I think what's also really core to our programming, and, and I will definitely talk about this a little bit later in, in some of the strategies that we use, but building a sense of community. Um, community was incredibly important to who we are and how our students talk about us when we were in person and that was really important as we thought about how to shift into a virtual setting. Um, when you ask our students to talk about breakthrough or describe breakthrough in one word, they often talk about it as being a sense of family, uh, a sense of and a place where they can find like-minded peers and like-minded learners. So that's incredibly important to who we are. And that was a lot of the work that we did um, when we thought about planning for virtual summer last summer and what is shaping up to be more of a hybrid summer this summer and leveraging what Ad, uh, Aaron shared about youth voice. Um, we definitely leveraged our scholar alumni and our teaching fellow alumni in our planning process because they are living virtual learning and distance learning every day. So what was working for them, what wasn't working for them um, in our planning um, as we shifted um, to both virtual and now to hybrid. So really excited to share and learn today. Thank you, Lauren. It sounds like um, you all have a, a very broad reach in Miami and are cultivating some family connections. So that's amazing. Thank you. Um, let's hear from Kate next. Hi, good afternoon. I am also very pleased to join this panel and all of you this afternoon. My name is Kate Barrett. I'm the editorial director of PBS Learning Media. PBS Learning Media is a free platform service for educators and students. We offer pre-K through 12 content that's aligned to national and state standards. Much of that content is created through and by our stations, which who are deeply involved in their communities and community partners and educators in their communities to create content and publish that content to PBS Learning Media. We, uh, today, I'd like to talk to you about what we typically do for summer and then what we're um, specifically doing for this, this challenging summer and the next few summers as well. We work closely and I can speak to um, what we're also doing across PBS Kids and PBS Parents and how we're all aligned. On Learning Media, we have more than 30,000 resources on our platform. Again, it's pre-K through 12. Um, most of these are for students and teachers. A lot of them are self-paced. Um, many are for classroom interactions. And um, a lot of what we've done in the last year and certainly what we're planning to do this summer is how we can create more flexibility in the use of the content that we have because again, it's free. And so we're really proud of what we have and, and building uh, and reaching more students, more teachers and more communities as best we can. Thank you, Kate. Um, so those of you who are paying attention to the chat or just listening in, um, NSLA is putting some resources in the chat from our panelists. So please um, check those out. You also got some shout outs of people already using PBS resources. So thank you, Kate. Um, so let's hear from Kurt, uh, the, our distinguished Apple educator, please. 
So, hi, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming um, and welcome. I am not um, affiliated with Apple. I am recognized by Apple as an educator. I'm actually coming to you from the city of brotherly and sisterly love Philadelphia right now. Um, so I work with kids, with teachers. I help design learning experiences and um, I will be sharing some of the resources that I've been using um, that are Apple resources, um, three things specifically, and that's the, uh, the everyone, uh, everyone can code, um, everyone can create and augmented reality. So I don't know, um, Leslie, if you wanna, want me to navigate through this presentation already, or if we pull this up during the, the, uh, the panel discussion. Um, whichever one you'd, you'd like with this, would we? I can pull them up as, as necessary if you, okay. if you want to. Um, okay. um, otherwise, I don't know how much time you, you're giving me now because I saw five minutes yeah, um, five might minutes. be quick. I can, I can go through it. Okay, let's go, let's go through them. It's good. Um, so if you can uh, skip to the next one, I'll talk when I, when I see. So this is me at the, uh, that was me at the um, University of Arkansas where we did a uh, Everyone Can Code um, um, coding club. And that's uh, actually leading exactly into that, that next slide that everyone can code, um, making it accessible to all, uh, reaching all uh, groups, um, being inclusive. And um, to do that, um, on the next slide, you'll see that there's two different coding clubs that you can set up. There's the Swift coding club that goes pre-K. And then you've got, if you want to go full blast um, Xcode, and these guides will help you with setting up a group, reaching out to um, uh, people to join, um, how to print your own rewards, certificates, t-shirts, all of that, running your own coding club over the summer and throughout the year and after school. And that's what we've been doing. Um, the next one that's part of that is um, the app design journal, thinking about what can we do with during this pandemic? You've seen a lot of innovation like Ad tech has been in a pressure cooker. So um, how can we as, uh, as this generation design apps that will uh, make a difference and, and leave the world in a better place than we found it? Um, leading up to the next resource, that's when we celebrate this. How can we celebrate what you've done, the prototyping, the trying to make it come to life, uh, coding bit, writing the actual code. So um, there's all free resources that you can use with the Apple technology, things like Keynote and Swift Playgrounds that you can download on um, iPad or on Mac. And then we'll go to the next resource. And this is if you really want some quick 10 activities. I really love the um, Code Your Camera, uh, where you can design your own camera, own filters with things like Snapchat and, and TikTok, um, having lots of potential during, uh, uh, during this pandemic. Um, that was my favorite one and go to the next one. Um, two um, uh, ideas of things that are happening already, the Montgomery uh, Public Schools, Montgomery County Public Schools are setting up a, a summer coding camp um, and they're linking it with the tech industry. Um, over here in New Jersey, we've got Boys and Girls Club that are helping them with the design. And that leads me into um, the thing I'll, I'll uh, discuss in just a few seconds is the creativity part. So you can go to the next one. And that's in DC. So everyone can code, um, preparing, meeting with um, the industry, getting feedback and, and giving back to your community. Going to the next slide. That's the everyone can create. And go and skip that one. There's uh, 60 activities that you can try out. And you can see them over here. Um, they go from really, really small. This one's uh, pre-K um, uh, all the way up um, till uh, fifth, sixth grade. And then um, my favorite one for yours, for instance, to go on a photo walk or a scavenger hunt where you, if you want to stay inside safely or you start exploring a little bit outside or just make a book. And the next one is 30 more activities. And in those, you can um, actually go into making maps and tourist maps for people. We've been taking people on virtual trips. I'm originally from Belgium. So I've been doing some virtual Philadelphia tours over here in, in that way. Um, working, working around that. So go to the next one, please. And that's the augmented reality, bringing that extra level in and not just, and this is the, the guide that goes with it, which you can download. And um, it's full of lesson ideas that you can try out, but also um, tips on how to make your own augmented reality. 
So that's the uh, augmented reality guide. And those are some of those three resources. Everyone can code, everyone can create, and augmented reality are the three things um, that Apple is offering throughout the summer. And then of course, they've got tons of other resources on that last slide. You will see uh, if you go to that link. Um, so you can teach and learn from any distance, whether you're hybrid, whether you're fully physical or whether you're teaching from, from home over the summer, um, have a look at that website. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it sounds like Apple has a lot of resources to share for our young people um, to support those uh, issues that we were talking about in the previous session, <laughs> sounds like. Okay, let's move on to our questions for this afternoon. We have three very important questions that we wanna ask our panelists. Um, and as much as possible, we'd like each person to share a response. So question number one, in preparation for summer 2020, many programs shifted their from their traditional in-person program models to offer virtual services. What will summer 2021 look like for your organization and why? In your response, please highlight how you are overcoming unique challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. If you would like to respond, please just come off mute. I'll jump in. So for PBS Learning Media specifically, I'll start there. What we've been hearing from our stations, and, and again, our, our, we have 350 member stations across the country. They're, um, available almost in every state, I believe. And we work closely with stations to identify areas of content needs in their community. So what we've been hearing from stations um, is not only that they're looking for more math materials, STEM literacy, but also social and emotional learning. So for us, we're balancing that need of providing um, materials that address uh, COVID learning loss, as well as some of these mental health and social emotional and sort of fatigue issues that we're hearing. and. Our approach is to offer more flexible resources. That's been our approach throughout COVID. So what that means is print more printable materials that our stations can bundle and share in their communities that our educators can use that we can deliver through the site. Um, more opportunities for professional development in learning and using some of the digital tools that we have and supporting our educators. Um, very early on in COVID, we tied a lot of our materials on learning media to broadcast. So there was a very specific broadcast to learning media component. So you can link uh, programming with educational materials. Uh, this summer, we'll be packaging content, some of these uh, flexible content like virtual tours, printables, activities that can be done easily at home, particularly in science and math, uh, as well as self-paced experiences on the site. Uh, we have traditional kind of summer camp activities that are built around some of the uh, more popular PBS kids programs like Odd Squad or PBS, uh, or I'm sorry, Peg Plus Cat. So those kinds of materials will be organizing within camp collections, as well as um, uh, summer learning collections. We'll be working closely with our outreach team who created some professional development uh, materials last summer, specifically on how on anti-racist education and how to be an anti-racist educator. And so we'll be launching part two of that series this summer. It was very popular last summer, um, as well as other professional development materials. Thank you, Kate. You all have a robust offering, it sounds like. Um, Lauren, I see you're off mute. Sure. So last summer, like many other agencies, we had to go completely virtual. Um, it is looking like we have the opportunity to be hybrid in various levels, depending on who our different partners are this summer. Um, as we know, it's really important to bring our students back together safely. So we're definitely looking forward to that opportunity. Um, through all of this, we, as I mentioned earlier, uh, trying to include student voice. So um, we meet bi-weekly with a group of our students, former students who are teaching fellows and volunteers to get their feedback. We roll out potential schedule ideas, everything that we're thinking about, like we're rolling out, getting their feedback, as well as we work with instructional coaches who are certified experienced educators who are currently in the classroom, whether virtual, hybrid, or in person. Um, so we're running a lot of our ideas and thoughts by them as well. So we're getting as much 
real time feedback on what's working, what's not working in, in the classroom. Um, and one of the major shifts that we did last summer was we've always kind of dabbled in project based learning, um, but we intentionally moved um, our delivery model from a direct instruction model to a, a project based learning model um, to leverage the, the shift in our schedule so students didn't have as much synchronous screen time. Um, and we saw a lot of wins um, in our students learning gains uh, with the project based learning shift. So that is something that we are keeping this summer as we continue to move hybrid. So really leveraging the project-based learning and um, building on those core skill sets uh, beyond just the content, but you know the 21st century learning skills and the social learning skills of collaboration, creative thinking, critical thinking, and things like that. Um, um, the other thing I think that we're really intentional about thinking about from the beginning was the digital learning competencies that the students would um, be gaining through this experience. So not just like, oh no, we have to be virtual and what does that mean? But like there are a lot of skill sets um, being built into this experience that will have they will have to carry on and leverage um, as their experience as students and adults and, and as professionals. So we leverage the, I, the ISTE um, standards and we're really thoughtful about how are we incorporating that and um, making sure that our students understood those skill sets that they were learning beyond just their core academics as well. Um, and then of course, we're always keeping our families in mind. So surveying our families to find out what their needs are, but also do they wanna come back on campus and what are their needs? Um, and then the last thing I was going to mention is we've really just intentionally been using um, our licensed mental health professional that we have on retainer um, to be thoughtful about our programming to provide student workshops as we think uh, see things come up. Um, since this summer, we have been doing monthly parent workshops um, based on parent feedback and what they've needed. So she hosts those once a month on Saturdays for our parents. Um, so those are some of the things that we've been thinking about from the initial shift and as we're continuing to plan for the summer. Thank you, Lauren. I like how you're um, partnering with the schools and the families to make sure you're continuing those services. Go ahead, Curtis. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, you know, we're, we're planning on having about 2000 students in person uh, uh, this year back in Baltimore City. Um, you know, I think the first piece uh, is, you know, that we were planning from the beginning now is we have to have that transition plan to be able to switch over to virtual. Um, and so <clears throat> that's happened already, you know, it happens a lot here. I know it's different by district, but I know for me going forward, I'm, that's always just gonna be something that I, I, I wanna have uh, thought about uh, in the beginning stages, because it's really not, now we know how to do it. So now it's really not that hard to think about it and have a plan for it. And so that's that's definitely been on our mind. Hopefully we don't have to use it, but you know, it, it's better to be prepared. And what happens when we're not prepared is that it's really the students that, that uh, are are bearing the brunt of that um, because if you don't do it well, uh, uh, there's there can be, you know, uh, issues there. So um, I mentioned, uh, so one of the things that's been a challenge for us is we tend, students in our program tend to probably interact either in small groups or in, in, in classroom settings with maybe seven to 10 adults uh, in the course of the program. Part of what we want to do uh, with our mission is as an arts organization, we want to expose them to a number of different art forms, for instance. And so for instance, our little, our little students, our K through two uh, students, uh, typically we would rotate them through a different teaching artist every week in the afternoon as their enrichment. And it's essentially kind of a, a, an introduction. So by the end of the five or six weeks, whatever it's going to be, they've done kind of, you know, six different art forms. Well, we can't do that anymore, but that's actually a place where we've decided to keep uh, the virtual element. And so um, in the past, we've, we've paid for two staff in the afternoon. Uh, one being the teaching artist and then another staff is kind of an assistant. Um, now what we're going to do is continue to pay either the classroom teacher or a teaching artist for the afternoon uh, to kind of build to be that kind of relationship connection, but then actually uh, using either both Zoom and some pre-recorded uh, content to still be able to uh, kind of expose students and, and accomplish that goal. Um, but in a safe manner uh, without bringing students into the room. Um, another 
uh, uh, thing that's been big for us and, and I wanted to mention because it came up uh, in, in the first hour is tutoring. So I know in Maryland, our, our state superintendent about two months ago started talking, uh, talking about high intensity tutoring all the time. And so I, I didn't know what that was. I was like, we gotta figure out what that means and how's that gonna trickle down to us, you know, in a few months. And so now, you know, it, uh, at least here in our district, it is definitely a, a, a focus area and priority, not just for our program, but for every program that is partnering with the, our, our district here. Um, and so uh, that has been, you know, there's, there's COVID implications there in terms of, of uh, if you're bringing more people into the building um, or making more cohorts uh, uh, or, you know, do we use technology, but then also how do we get the people? And, and one, of the, um, uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping is gonna work out for, for us in, this, in, in our case is partnering with a couple of different uh, alternative teaching certification programs um, to bring in people that are, that are newer uh, that maybe haven't, you know, haven't completed that yet, um, but are, are interested and, uh, you know, and, and have a passion for working with kids. And um, so uh, I think there's a number of those here in our city that we've worked with over the, over the, over the years. And it seems to be like, it, it might be a good uh, a partnership for, for this summer. Thanks, Curtis. It sounds like um, the pandemic has changed our program for the future <laughs> completely. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, before um, we have Mr. Kleinen uh, respond, Kurt, uh, I do wanna make reference to our Q&A uh, function in Zoom. There's been some questions that are in the chat. Please put them in the Q&A so that we can refer to them after our next two questions. Um, Kurt, did you have a response? Yeah, I just I just wanted to respond in a way that how I I've been leveraging leveraging uh, things as an educator is um, there's some resources that I go to to get trained before I can go do this and um, uh, the the last section on that last resource that I shared on on Apple's website is um, how you can get in contact with their Apple professional learning specialists and they will have virtual conferences. So those are like hour long sessions that I, I would jump in on learning more about augmented reality before I will try it out with the kids. Or um, if I have an idea, you can sign up for like a 30 minute one-to-one um, -one coaching session and say, hey, I'm gonna do this learning over the summer. Um, uh, where would you guide me? Um, how would I tackle this? So those are two of the options. And then if I, if I need ideas, I will go into their Apple Teacher Learning Center or just as, Apple Distinguished Educators, we are encouraged to um, share what we're doing. And on, on Twitter on Tuesdays, we do um, chats. And, and I bet you that summer learning is one of the topics that's going to come up. So um, if you follow the um, at Apple EDU and the hashtag Apple EDU chat, that's every Tuesday at um, six o'clock Pacific time, so nine o'clock Eastern. Um, if you need tons of ideas and, and people like-minded like me who are using technology and education to, to make that difference, um, those are places I would recommend to go uh, get trained. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so make sure you all take advantage of that free training. <laughs> okay, um, our second question. Many programs plan around a theme or focus area each summer. Please share any focus areas or themes your summer initiatives will highlight and why those topics are important. Again, just come off mute if you would like to share. I'll jump in first again. Um, uh, for, for PBS uh, across our children's media and education, that includes PBS Learning Media, PBS Kids for Parents, and PBS Kids, we're thinking of summer possibilities, so play or learn your way. Back to that, what I'd mentioned earlier about um, supporting educators, parents, students with sort of flexible materials and flexible means for them. So some of what we, we've, we um, and so that, that has been the priority for us, and some of what we've done last summer particularly included you know, online digital read-alongs, um, virtual engagement for educators, family and families and children, um, ch and child learning events. Um, we've had, and we will be doing this summer particularly, more um, professional development training 
which was very popular last summer. We want to continue doing it this summer as well. And then again, um, packaging our materials in such a way that it, teachers and parents um, can access them as easily and cleanly as possible. Um, so that could be printable materials. It can be, um, you know, additional um, self-paced courses if they wanted to use them, fun videos, fun activities. Our PBS Kids for Parents site um, publishes both um, activities that can be done, simple STEM activities at home, as well as PBS Learning Media. We have videos that support those kinds of activities as well as self-paced lesson plans, which have an interactive component to them, as well as printable materials. So sort of summer possibilities, play, learn your way has been um, the focus for us. Thank you. I'll jump in next again. So I think, as I've mentioned, I think community is always our overarching goal. Um, and how do we create that? So one of the things I didn't mention when we were in person, we have um, daily all school meetings where our entire community came together. So we were thoughtful about how we translate that into the virtual world, how we highlight and honor scholars that have, you know, exceeded expectations that week and our teams are I mean, we're super lucky to have young, energetic 17 to 24 year olds leading programming. So they come up with the most creative ways. Um, but I think something that's unique to really um, one build community that we do every year and like really leverage students creative and collaboration skills is we do have a summer theme that's meant to be really fun and engaging and to, to build that collaboration. My team might hurt me because the entire team doesn't know what the theme is this summer, though I'm very excited about it. But I'll share about last summer's Theme, which was breaking through to the future. So a play on Back to the Future. Um, so the students are in advisories and each advisory works on a team challenge every week and they present them Friday at our all school meetings. So like the first week they had to create their time machine. Um, so what materials were used, what was the science behind it. So really creative and getting them to work together around things like that. Um, so there's a lot of really exciting um, opportunities and for the students to like come together and they figured out how to, like they would schedule their own advisory Zoom calls to work on that. So it gave them sense to ways to, to think about it, um, not just about I'm sitting in a classroom to learn about math today. So that, that's been really important for us um, in how we use like that theme, that fun summer theme to help build that sense of community. Um, and I was just going to answer because there are some questions in the chat about our project based learning that I was just going to address that I saw. So in a traditional setting, we would have math, English, science and social studies every day, kind of 45 minutes a day in a regular like kind of school format. Um, being thoughtful about like what transitions look like in a virtual world and um, just being aware of like synchronous times, we we shifted that. So like Mondays was math, Tuesdays was English, Thursdays was social, you know, a schedule like that, where on that one day when they were doing synchronous activities for um, that academic core area was when they were being presented with what the project was. So there was a little bit of direct instruction to prep that project. There was asynchronous modules that the students would be able to watch to be able to dive more into that content area. Um, and then the teachers would schedule one-on-one -on -one check ins with the students uh, throughout the week to make sure that they were progressing through their project. And then the following week, the students would present back that project that was leading up to the final artifact at the end of the summer. So just to give an example of kind of what that structure looked like, um, how we played that out over the summer. So. Thanks, Lauren. Guess we'll keep the order going. <laughs> um, so we don't really have a, a theme like a lot of summer camps uh, I know do. Um, uh, we do have what we call big ideas and little ideas. Our big idea is always the same every year, which is art connects all. Um, and then our, our little ideas uh, last year, for instance, were identity, community, and advocacy. Um, what we are looking at this year, which I'm really excited about, and most of this really comes out in in either kind of our literacy instruction, which is 90 minutes arts integrated every day, and also that kind of afternoon, uh, more creative expression uh, 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 time. Um, but we essentially took kind of those, those same ideas of identity community, community and advocacy and built out uh, uh, not only a, a, a weekly theme, but essentially nonfiction and fiction texts 
that were chosen by our teachers as well as a group of students um, that are super cool. We've got actually a lot of uh, local texts written by like people from Baltimore um, that are I'm really excited about. And so we're essentially kind of taking students through uh, week weeks one and two are really around identity. And then we move into community and diversity and then week four justice and then week five activism and action. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I like how we've kind of, you know, uh, evolved, uh, you know, something that we started a couple of years ago in, in terms of the general ideas, but uh, I think it's, it's a lot more cohesive and uh, I'm excited about all the tentacles and ways that that ties in both in literacy and in creative expression. So. I, I think from uh, what I've seen Apple do um, recently is try to create those um, community hubs for, for coding and creativity, hence the, the resources I shared on everyone can code and everyone can create and and everyone literally means everyone. Like those resources for coding, um, I know are transformed to make them accessible, whether you have um, low vision, um, you uh, have a physical disability or a hearing loss like my brother-in-law um, or learning disability. So they're focused on that because they work with the, uh, the built-in features on, on their Mac or, or iPad devices. So those two themes, the creativity and, and coding, I feel like that's the big thing that, that Apple has been doing um, for years now. And, and this curriculum is uh, what supports that. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for your responses. I was excited to hear about um, the things that you all are doing to try to make things more inclusive. Um, and that rolls right into our third and final question before we get to um, audience members questions. So our third question, our work aims to support all young people and the people who support them. While providing accessible resources, considerations must be made to ensure supports are provided and experienced in an equitable and inclusive manner. According to the Ford Foundation, equity seeks to ensure fair treatment, equality of opportunity, and fairness in access to information and research resources for all. Inclusion builds a culture of belonging by actively inviting the contribution and participation of all people. Please discuss how your organi organization oper operationalizes equitable and inclusive principles to ultimately support young people. I'll get us started again. So as public media, PBS broadly is committed to diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, for PBS Learning Media, I can speak to you specifically and, and, and broadly for PBS, what we're looking at and we're committed to particularly coming out of this last year is how content is created, whose voices are heard, and what stories are being told. And that includes who's creating the content. Are we representing not only stories in the content itself, but who are the people that are, that are being, who are creating the media, who are creating the content for our website? So we're making considerable efforts to um, work with um, a DEI board, an advisory board that we're pulling together to actually do an, an equity audit essentially of our content really based on those principles of who, who stories are being told, what stories aren't being told, what are the instructional design principles and practices that we can not only embody and show in the content that we create and publish on our platform, but that we can share with our stations and our station educators so they can also develop that same content that represents their communities. And this is something we hear strongly from our stations. Last year happened to be uh, and a year that we were doing research on our platform. So in addition to this flood of traffic that we had from COVID and educators and parents and students looking for materials when they were sort of thrust into this digital learning environment, but we were also doing research on our platform. And what our research showed us, told us and what we already knew is that 
um, you know, having a diverse set of storytellers and stories is, is of primary importance to educators and having the materials that they use in their classroom reflect their classrooms is, is a priority for them. And, and of course, it's a priority for us too. So I mentioned earlier that last summer we had a professional development training program that our community and engagement team put on tools for anti-racist teaching. Part one was last summer. It was immensely popular. They're um, developing as, as I speak, um, part two that will roll out this summer. Uh, our Teachers Lounge blog, um, which that team also manages and develops, are, they're creating a whole unlearning series for the summer as well. So looking at um, you know, what, some of those traditional stories that have been told and the voices that have been left out and how we need to unlearn certain things in history that we've been taught because just by nature of not having a full story being told. And so this is really hard work and deep work and it's something that we're committed to. Um, and before I, I, I pass the baton, I, I do wanna mention, it's something I was remiss in, in mentioning earlier that because so much of our work is with stations and stations are so connected locally, um, in their communities with community partners. That one thing I would encourage um, everyone here and program directors here on, on this call, if you're interested to reach out to your local station and see how you can work with them specifically um, and brainstorm and how you can work together because they are active partners with us. They're working with educators in their communities. We're working with educators on their staff to publish content on our site and, and make sure that we create not only create media, media that uh, reflects everyone, but can reach everyone in, in as many ways as we can make that happen. Thank you, Kate. That is refreshing to hear. Um, so do you want to keep the order? Laura, would I'll you keep like it going. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, sure. So um, similar to how Kate started um, diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, belonging is core to breakthrough. It has been core to breakthrough for the 30 years of our existence, and we, we, can, we can continue to become more intentional about that work, too. Um, so I think one of the areas where we start is, as I said, we recruit 17 to 24-year-olds to be our teaching fellows. We are intentional in making sure that our teaching fellow core is as reflective of, of the students um, that we serve as possible, so they can see role models in the classroom that, that look like them and leaders that look like them. Um, one of our um, scholars who graduated high school a few years ago, who's returned as one of our teaching fellows recently just wrote an op-ed about how at Breakthrough was one of the first times he saw a black male teacher in the classroom and the impact that that has had on him and why that has changed his trajectory to study elementary education and become an elementary school teacher. So, uh, so starting with our teaching fellow core and then the training that we provide them um, to be sure that they're thinking about these skill sets when they enter the classroom and work with our students. Um, we are also thinking about the resources um, and the curriculum that we put in front of them. So all of our literature books are written by people of color, about people of color. Um, so making sure that the, the content that they're diving into is relatable um, to them as well. Um, we also have a unique model where um, our host school institutions are um, private independent schools and our students are obviously coming from the, the public school community to these communities, uh, these private school communities when they're coming to programming on Saturdays and during the school summer. And so many of the students at the independent schools become our volunteers and teaching fellows as well. Um, so about three years ago, we started a program called Breakthroughs and Bridges um, that encourages um, facilitated dialogue and that happens a few times a year that brings both our students and the host school students together. Um, so that's something that we continue to grow upon um, and, and giving the students skill sets to then lead these conversations back at their schools, whether it be the independent school or, or their public schools as well. So also giving students the, the skill sets to continue to lead these dialogues themselves to be comfortable in those spaces so that they can be leaders back at their spaces as well. Um, the other thing is a lot of our content, um, both in our school year program and over the summer, has an underlying social justice um, theme to it. So um, making sure that our students understand to, how, how they can use their voice to influence change within their community. So uh, when our sixth graders are focused on the arts theme, we are partnered with um, one of our cultural institutions, the Modern Art Museum here locally, uh, the Perez Art Museum here in Miami. And the program that we do with them uses art inquiry um, 
education, but brings students and police officers together to help um, break down the walls between youth and police officers using art education as an example. We're also intentional about teaching students like how do you write to your congressman, you know, and think and skill sets like that. So they're diving into their content, but figuring learning how they can use their voice to create change at the same time. So just some examples about how we're thinking about DEIJ. And I think to piggybacking off of some of the things I said earlier about building community, building belonging, and, and, and it being a, a family environment and a space where they find community, like-minded peers. It's something that they say often to us. It's, it's an environment of love. It's an environment of family. Um, I think it's really important and is rooted in that as well. So just, you know, some of, some of the areas that we're um, exercising DEI operationally. Thanks, Lauren. Um... That's awesome how you are putting the baton back into the people's hands. Um, we do have 10 minutes left, um, two more people to respond to this question and we want to get to Q&A. I just wanted to quickly refer to the chat again. There is a lot of resources being shared. Please make sure you check that out. Cool, I'll, I'll keep this brief and, and just highlight two specific things. Uh, there's, there's more than these two, but uh, in the, in, uh, uh, for time's sake. Um, the first, and really here's what I mostly wanna say when it comes to uh, doing this work is, uh, uh, you know, um, we are all in different places uh, when, when kind of approaching this work, but a lot of what it comes down to is just making the money available and making these things non-negotiable um, and, and, and paying people for their time and making sure that people are represented and, uh, uh, we are, there is the voice at the table, right? And so, uh, two, two ways in which, uh, that's kind of manifest itself over the couple, last couple of years for us is for, for our su summer program and actually other programs at the, uh, at our, at our organization, uh, we do both implementation teams and uh, working groups. And so we pay um, a number of, uh, depending on the size of the project, three to five folks to be involved in meetings every week where we're making all of the decisions about everything. Um, and then when we don't make decisions in those meetings, if there's more time needed, we pay them to be a part of a working group with whoever's on staff is, is kind of leading that um, and allow them to guide that, that work that way. Um, that's for, for, for our budget for this coming summer, that's about 10, 10 grand of cost for us. Um, and it's just something that when we said, this is what, this, we just said, this is what we need. Um, and my second example is, um, and this is what I'm really, um, I'm, I'm most proud of from this past year. I mentioned we're running an, an in-person pilot uh, summer uh, after school program for the district, um, which, you know, they asked us to do last minute and, you know, we didn't necessarily want to do it, but uh, we, in the process of kind of negotiating with them, uh, we basically were able to uh, uh, make a case for why we, we wanted to do a year long, all staff, which is about 70 staff, um, uh, uh, race equity kind of program that was specifically geared at both some healing and some like building shared understanding, but also really geared towards improving practice in the classroom or impacting practice and changing practice um, at all levels of staff. And so uh, we, we, uh, we basically uh, built out about a $60,000 project uh, and put it in the budget and said, if we're going to do this, this is now what we need to do. And this needs to be a part of our training. And, you know, I think that's one way where we need to be pushing, uh, especially, you know, when it comes down to money, it's easy to say we don't have the money to do it. Um, but, you know, that's, we have the money to do everything else. So we can figure it out. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, it's just got to be non-negotiable. So that's, I think that's my takeaway. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Kurt. Yeah, I'll, I'll, and I'll keep it short. I think um, I'm like one out of 2,500 Apple Distinguished Educators. So Apple's a global company. So representing everyone and is, is I think, core to their value. And we feel that because we are encouraged to um, work together because none of us are the same. And, and that's the greatest strength on the project that I've been, been part of. Um, any piece of content that we've interacted with to um, representing our students and and that's the the beauty they really I feel at least that they really create something that serves everyone 
um, because they believe in including everyone, regardless of skin color, background, age, gender, um, and, and, and so on and so on. So I, I feel that in all the resources, and that's why um, that's with my core values and they align with Apple's, um, that I share these with you. Thank you, Kurt. Um, I'm looking through the questions um, for audience questions. We have time for maybe about three or four of them before we have to close out. Um, so panelists, listen up. We'll have, take about one or two responses to the questions. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do any of the participants offer virtual collaborative opportunities to increase our services? I will provide mental health component led by a licensed clinician and we can offer this virtually via Zoom sessions. Um, so the question is, do you all offer virtual collaborative opportunities to people who support young people and their families? Yeah, I guess I'll go for that one. Oh, oh, Kate, one. oh no, no, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just I just wanted to have, give a quick example um, where um, I have a, a brother in law who's um, who's uh, a deaf and uh, we went to a coding uh, workshop together and Apple had uh, someone who was sign languaging in uh, American Sign Language uh, was in the DC area. So um, we always feel like there's something to support us in whatever way we need. Thank you. Um, anyone else had a burning response? No, I mean, I just would add, we, we run through our community engagement team throughout the, well, throughout the year. And then of course this summer, um, many virtual events, training events, and just virtual events with, with parents, with, um, with educators as well, professional development, and uh, just broadly learning opportunities, so. Thank you. Um, I do have another question here that seems very relevant. How do your organizations make space for special education when organizing for youth? Um, I'll, I'll share really quick. So about 10% of our student population are students uh, with special needs. Um, so I, I think a lot of our core programming lends itself. We, all of our classroom structures are really small. We usually only have about 10 to 15 students per class. So it allows for some more individualization. Um, and with the onset of COVID um, in the virtual setting, every student had at least one one-on-one -on -one check in in a week. And the purpose of those one-on-one -on -one check ins were to monitor the progress of how they were doing in each of their classrooms. So like this was able to um, address strategies that students should have in place um, and support them in creating those strategies and habits um, to be able to successfully navigate their academics and the program at, at large. So those are just two, two things, small classes and those individual check-ins um, helped us support that, those students this summer. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question before we close out. Um, let's see. One, which date for the summer coding camp? I think that's quick. Uh, are there in-person summer coding camps? If so where, which state was that in? And if it was a missed hearing, please just clarify. The two examples I showed were virtual. So Montgomery uh, County, that's, uh, that's virtual um, because all the activities can be done at home and, and they do Zoom meetings. Uh, same for the DC ones. Thank you. So for those who do not know, Montgomery County is in Maryland. Um, okay, I think one other question just, okay. All right, I'm gonna ask this one last one. We are a wraparound summer program providing academic and emotional support. Has any of your research suggested a need to incorporate emotional intelligence in summer programs? Curtis is shaking his head, I guess. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, definitely. Um, I, I can just speak right now. I'm, I'm per personally running up against the challenge of making a case for why that's still important, especially this summer, and, and why, you know, eight hours of, of reme remediation is, is not going to work, right? <laughs> so I think it's been a challenge it's like that stuff goes, we were building it up so nicely, get building the case for why that's so important. And it's the first thing to just drop back off. 
Thanks, and I Curtis. Just, oh, I'll sorry. just share anecdotally, as I shared earlier, we have monthly parent workshops um, with our licensed mental health uh, professional. We just had one on Saturday and the topic was anxiety in the teenage brain. And I can just tell you our parents were clamoring for the information from from our uh, partner because they are starting to feel it even more ways that we are a year out. So I think it is, as Kurt, uh, Curtis shared, it has social emotional learning, emotional intelligence has always been important to our work, but I think more importantly than ever, as I think we are just starting to see some of the stressors um, manifest um, in, in ways that no one could have expected or we could have perceived, but like we are starting to see that manifestation in, in deep ways um, now that we've been into this for, for a year now. Thanks, Lauren. Um, Curtis, there was a question um, that I'd like you to just answer in the chat. Folks want to know how they can get involved with your organization, if you could just share your information. Um, but thank you to all of the panelists for joining us today. I really enjoyed uh, the time that we got to share. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful leader, Mr. Aaron Dorkin, uh, to close us out. Thank you. Thank you, Devani. Thank you to all the amazing panelists and all the research and information that you shared with our community today. We, we feel so fortunate. And, and the best piece of everything here is that for anyone who's out there feeling alone, please know you're not alone. That whatever project you're working on, you have everyone who spoke today and all the people who called in uh, are really here to help you. We are a community. And that came up a lot today. And so we talk about summer learning as a metaphor for inequity. It's a, a metaphor for opportunity. It's also a metaphor for community. And the secret sauce of all our programs and all the programs that win our national awards is that they build community, they build relationship, and everyone cares about each other in that program. And that's why it can be called summer learning and not only summer school, because we make it feel different. Yes, we're trying to meet the academic goals of our district partners and school partners, but we could do it in a different way. We have a little flexibility to be creative. And that's where our partners from Scholastic and Apple and PBS, everybody wants to help. So now that can feel overwhelming. But we have to just, we, it's March 1st, we have a few months, we, we could get this together, you have all these uh, opportunities and people who want to help you. And I just want to also acknowledge the real exhaustion for our, our, our teaching uh, partners who've done a Herculean uh, job, trying to lead on Zoom for months. And so we, when we talk about summer learning loss, this has not been a lost year. People have been learning, people have been teaching, but it's not the way we want it to be. And, and so while some folks are excited for the summer, some people are exhausted by the idea of the summer. And I was just flag that because that's a chance for us to again partner and, and to help those who, who, you know, we have some people who are exhausted, some people who have been stifled and been chomping at the bit and didn't even get to run their programs last summer and can't wait. And so the question for all of us is how do we connect the dots and how do we reach across our, our kind of our, you know, our comfort zones and our silos and, and build the programs that students want and need and families want and need there should be some federal funding coming. It's being negotiated right now. There could be some additional state funding. So money might be available. So that's why we're gonna take the next few days and keep learning from our, our partners to figure out how do we get this right? Uh, this is the start of a conversation, it's not the end. Tomorrow, I just wanna highlight what we have on the agenda. The American Camp Association uh, is gonna be uh, co-presented the day by NCASE, National Center in After School and Summer Enrichment. But the American Camp Association, if you don't know them, there's national CEO. We'll be leading a panel at one o'clock Eastern time with uh, leaders of YMCA camps talking about COVID safety. This group has done a leading job on figuring out how to run safe, healthy programs for young people and staff during COVID. I mean, magnificent national leadership uh, role they've taken and they will be sharing what they've learned uh, with us. And then the second uh, session will be about how do we incorporate enrichment and, and health and fitness programs that our students want and our staff want to do into programs and the Alliance for Healthier Generation and After School All Stars will be joining us. And we all these programs are research based, they're best practices. We have a lot more to share so people feel uh, excited and, and know again, we're not making this up. We have decades of research to support how to do this well. We want to make sure every young person in America this summer can afford and access the high quality summer learning experiences you heard on this call. Thank you for your time today. Thanks for your commitment. And we will be with you tomorrow. Please bring friends, one o'clock East Coast time, uh, same Zoom link. And thank you, Leslie. And again, our, all our panelists and moderators for a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.